Hey, this is Steve Earl. Welcome to Guitar Town. So, um, I got a lot of guitars. All those cases you saw on that 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 photo that I took with my telephone um, a couple few nights ago. Um, those are that's about half of the guitars I own. Um, you're seeing most of the guitars in that room. About two thirds of them are in that room. I, I'm, I'm I have a disease and. Um, I've been collecting guitars for a while now. I started really back in the 80s, but then all those guitars went in my arm. And um, and then the mid-90s, I kind of started my life over, and I started buying some guitars and taking some interest in it. Ray Kennedy had a really nice guitar collection when he and I became partners in the recording studio. So I got interested in it then. Uh, I did hanging out around, you know, some of the best guitar shops. I mean, the, that whole Ben's guitar business was invented in New York City and Nashville, like, George Groom uh, and, Matt, and and here in Nashville and Matt even off in, in New York City and then other people kind of followed their example and started dealing in in, in vintage guitars and and um, you know and it doesn't when George is always talking about this when he started out like you know um, in the, the early 70s I bought the first really nice guitar I owned was a 1950. Well, I had a I had a D18. I had a pre-order D18 when I was a kid. I paid $150 for it, but the neck was so out of whack. Nobody in San Antonio knew how to work on them, so I traded it for an Alvarez straight across. That's just kind of heartbreaking to me now. But I needed something that worked, and then I played that for a while. And then the next guitar that I so I literally arrived in Nashville with uh, $37 on a Jack guitar. That's that, that that's two things I didn't make up. And I sold that Alvarez to a guy I worked with in a restaurant here in town, and I took that money and a little bit more of my first check for my first publishing deal, and I went down to GTR, it was called in those days, for George Tut and Randy, which was which was George Green and Tut Taylor, and, and um, just, um, it was kind of, uh, uh, I, I, I was a pretty, pretty amazing place. I mean, they had, um, and I, a, a 1956 Gibson I bought was $250, which is what they went for at the time. The Martins brought more money. Um, I don't know, 1956 J45s was at least seven or $8,000 that day. So, you know, a 1956 guitar was only, you know, like, like less than 20 years old when I bought that guitar. So all of that's changed. And, and um, I moved to New York City 15 years ago, and I had to live right behind Matt Human off guitars, and that that had a lot to do with that to crank it up my habit and I was starting to make a little bit more money and I started buying guitars. Uh, it's a good place for me to put money because I kind of don't understand Wall Street and kind of don't believe in it and um, if I'm going to gamble I'll just go to a casino. Um, but um, guitars are something that I understand that I love and, and um, they are valuable if you buy the right things they will hold their value. Um, um, I. I had about 240 instruments at one point, but I sold a lot of stuff, mostly custom shop type stuff, newer stuff that was limited in, in numbers that might be worth some money in the future, um, that made by Martin and Bender especially. Um, I sold that stuff so I could hang under the bin and stuff. This isn't the guitar I've had the longest. It's not the oldest guitar I own, but it's one of the oldest. Uh, I don't name guitars normally, but this one gets referred to as Doris or Doris's guitar because I bought this guitar through Matt Humanoff, but it's one of two guitars that belonged to Doris Abrams, who was a folk singer around Greenwich Village before I ever got there. Uh, I met her once in Matt Humanoff's shop where after she brought these guitars in to sell them. She lives in California now. And she's a, we have in common both a huge New York Yankees fan. Uh, but she, uh, she had a C2 conversion, we'll talk about that later, converted type of Martin, a Martin archtop converted to a flat top that Matt built. And she had this guitar. Now Matt's recollection is that Doris might have brought this bought this guitar from a place called Unredeemed Pledges, which was a which was a guy that bought stuff from pawn shops and, you know, from people that unfortunately unfortunately have to lose it and and he sold them, you know, at at, uh, at, at a profit. And uh, it was they sold he so he dealt in all kinds of things that people had lost track of. Um, this is a size one Martin guitar. It was originally built for gut strings, all Martin guitars of this era were, but this one 
it was, it's been had skill streams on it for a long time and it survived it. Uh, Matt always set it up with 11s, very, very light steel strings. I keep 11s on it as well because it's pretty lightly built. This guitar was built in the 1890s. Now, if this guitar had been built 1898 or later, we'd be able to date it almost a minute because Martin keeps great records. But they did not have serial numbers before 1898. Um, so this being uh, appointments, um, and experts looking at it tell us the guitar was built sometime in the 1890s, sometime between 1890 and 1898. But, but more, most of the people I know that looked at this think it was built sometime the middle of the decade, 1895, 1896, something like that. Uh, it's a style 28 guitar. The first number in the modern guitar is the, is the size, which is size one. And this was, people would call this a parlor guitar now, because I think it's a misnomer, because this was just a guitar when it was built. This was the standard Martin size, uh, size of a Martin guitar. They, as the numbers went up, and they, they started with size one, and the numbers went up, the guitars got smaller. So they went to um, it was a size one, a size two, and a size three, I believe. I've never had my hands on one. Um, um, no, maybe I did have a three. I can't remember. I'll have to look. I've never seen a size four Martin. I don't know whether they ever built them. That's something that to answer uh, later. And size five, which is the some people call the baby Martin, the one that Marty Robbins played, and the one that that um, Bobby Gentry played. Uh, and I've got two or three versions of a size five guitar, a tenor, and two or three other um, two, you know six string uh, size five guitars. Um, this is a style 28 guitar. That second number is the style, which means the wood that it's made from, the grade of the wood it's made from, and the appointment stuff like on a pre-war, uh, pre-World War II, that is, um, Martin guitar style 28 includes, uh, we'll switch over to this other camera here. Um, that would include this herringbone trim, which you can see around the sound hook, I mean around the, the edge of the, of the guitar, around the binding. And uh, you know, this, this, there's a, this particular pattern of rings around the sound hole, that's style 28, it's pretty, pretty intricate. There's a couple of wider white rings and then there's a bunch of tiny black ones. The back is, and sides are made of rosewood, very beautiful straight grain rosewood. That's, uh, let me see if I can get this where you can, the light's not in our way. I'm going to do this in the middle of the night if the light's not awful. But um, this rosewood, nowadays um, people associate, this is Brazilian rosewood, and uh, which is you can't get it anymore. It's just kind of all gone because people have been plundering Brazil for a long time, and this kind of old rosewood just doesn't exist there anymore. They can't sell it anymore. Um, it's, um, this is, this, uh, nowadays people associate Brazilian rosewood because what there is around has a lot of really swirly grain in it and um, some light color wood in it. That Martin would have thrown that, that, that wood away at the time that this guitar was built. The, the tuners are, are uh, the buttons are, are um, ivory. And yes, it's elephant ivory, but I didn't kill the elephant. Um, it's, um, this, is, this guitar is a really, really good guitar. Um, I've, uh, I'm very proud of it. Mark Silver, who was Matt Uinoff's mentor in a lot of ways, he was a great guitar player, still a great guitar player, and built, uh, he, had a, he had a workbench in the back of, of uh, Izzy Young's place. Um, and he, um, you know, the, the folklore center in Grand Village, and, and, uh, he, uh, and then later on he had a shop of his own and then he moved away and uh, ended up, he's in California these days in San Miguel, the other day part of the time. And still a great guitar player and, uh, mm. and still deals guitars. Um, he, has, he, has, he has a lot of guitars in his collection. Uh, he doesn't really have a shop anymore, but uh, he sells them online, sells them to people, and, 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 and builds a guitar every once in a while. But Mark, um, you know, was one of the founders of this, uh, this whole deal of, of taking care of and restoring these guitars. And he, uh, he believed that the American guitar, the story of the typically American flat-top guitar that Martin invented, and these are 
immigrants from Germany building guitars, based originally, I think, a lot of it on, on some on Spanish instruments, but mainly on instruments that were built in France. The Germans took it from there. And um, the, this, this size one Martin, this size, is, is, according to Mark, where it all begins for the history of the American guitar, which is the reason I started with this. So I, I do use this guitar, I play it. And uh, uh, I used it on the Towns record, because I just purchased it when the Towns record was made. And I used it to record Blood Supply, and I used it to record Poncho and Lefty. So I'm going to play a little Poncho and Lefty, or I'll play all the Poncho and Lefty for you, and you can kind of hear how it sounds. It's a really, really good guitar. Martin 128. 